we go back to the main page and we're actually done with the basic parameters for the BRT system. Now we move towards defining the uh, data for the intensity and the emission factors. So earlier we looked at the activity and the structure of the transportation system. So we go back to the whole ASIF framework, activity, structure, intensity, emission factor. These are all the same parameters that are being used in the model to calculate the emissions reductions. Now we define this. Now you see different factors here. Fuel split, fuel type split. Uh, this is basically the split of the vehicles in terms of their fuel type. Technology split, split of the different vehicle fuel combinations into um, emissions technology standards, let's just, such as uh, pre-Euro, Euro 1, Euro 2, Euro 3, and so forth. You can define the fuel efficiency, uh, kilometer per unit of consumption at 50 kilometers per hour. We're using here 50 kilometers per hour as the default since um, most of the modes are actually uh, running on an ideal fuel efficiency at 50 kilometers per hour. There are certain penalties in terms of the fuel consumption and the emissions. Um, if you go up or down the 50 kilometer per hour um, speed. But later on, I'll explain how you can uh, reflect average um, fuel efficiency values here without going through the 50 kilometer per hour adjustments. And here you would define the speeds, um, the occupancies, basically how many people would be inside a certain vehicle at any given time, the trip length for the different modes, uh, speed impact, we'll show that later. Uh, users can choose what speed curves they would like to employ for a certain mode, whether it would act like a bus, it would act like a car, a two-wheeler, a three-wheeler, in terms of the penalty when it comes to um, the fuel efficiency and speed um, interaction. And lastly, you would have to define the PM, or the particulate matter emission factors, the NOx emission factors, and finally, the CO2 emission factors. Okay, let's click on this. Now here, we have some um, data that uh, were already inputted into the model. So you can see here, these are the same um, modes that were inputted in the uh, mode share table that uh, we've seen earlier. And uh, we are asked here to define how many of the cars are actually running on petrol, how many of them are running on diesel, or even LPG, CNG, or if any of them are running on electric. And uh, you can actually define another fuel here if you want, like uh, LNG or something like that. And it would give you some, again, some uh, guidance in terms of the color coding later on, so we'll make the uh, input easier. Since we have some limited data for the fuel split uh, for, the, for Bandung, we are assuming the same splits would occur in uh, 2019, 2029. But definitely, if we have um, better local data in the future, we definitely recommend to update these values as um, these values would realistically uh, differ from uh, current values and also to reflect a more dynamic uh, kind of uh, baseline for the different vehicles. So right now we're saying 70% uh, is petrol and 30% is diesel for cars. 100% petrol for two-wheelers, 90% uh, petrol, 10% uh, diesel for taxis, 
split for the two three wheelers. Buses are running 100% on uh, buses or diesel. RTVs are diesel, and uh, we're assuming that the BRT would also be running on diesel. Now, there's a small table, table here um, which asks you the unit of consumption for the different types of fuel. So for petrol, diesel, LPG, we have liters, we have CNG as kg, uh, electric as kilowatt hour. So it depends really on the um, type of fuel that you are using and what are the parameters that are associated with the, the fuels. You can actually define the unit of consumption. This would be used as labels later on. And uh, once you have this table running, later you would see how it would connect to the next tables in terms of the uh, technology split and the uh, emission factors. So, for example, remember here uh, that for cars we have 70, 30 for petrol and diesel and nothing on the others like zero LPG, zero CNG, zero electric. And uh, once we move to the next section, we go here, technology split. You can see here that the, uh, the car table or the car or the rows that are for the cars for gasoline and diesel have orange uh, cells in them. Actually, if you don't, these are preloaded data, but uh, if you have them blank, these were actually orange. What it means is that you have to put something in them. But for the others, these are blue, so you don't need to worry about them since you don't have them in the fuel split. So none of your cars are running on LPG, for example, or CNG or electric and you don't need to worry about putting technology splits here because none of them are actually running on these fuels. So, okay, sorry. Um, these tables here would ask you to input percentages in terms of the distribution of the different vehicle fuel combinations into different emission technology or standard categories. So you can actually define it. You can use pre-Euro, Euro 1, Euro 2, Euro 3. Or if in your country you don't have um, Euro 1, you can change this to Euro 2, change this to Euro 3, change this to Euro 4, as long as you change the corresponding emission factors that would come later on. So these are placeholders for the uh, labels for the emission standards. Now, this split is important, particularly in coming up with an aggregate emission factor for particulate matter and NOx, as these uh, traditional air pollutants are very much influ influenced by how the fuel is burned in the vehicles and what after exhaust technologies are actually being employed by the vehicles. Not like CO2, which uh, is mainly dependent on how much CO2 is being burnt or how much fuel is being burnt. And uh, the emission standard technologies doesn't really matter that much. So again, you input the values here as for the stable we have assumed more realistic values as we have assumed that in the future, the, the vehicles would actually shift towards higher emission standards or uh, in terms of the distribution for the different vehicles. Um, so we're scrapping Euro 1 and moving towards, uh, sorry, scrapping pre-Euro, moving towards Euro 1, 2, 3. And in 2029, it's going to be Euro 2 and Euro 3. Same with diesel. And uh, yeah, 
for simplicity's sake, we have uh, currently those uh, two types of um, fuels. And once you have completed that, you now go to defining the fuel efficiency at 50 kilometers per liter. Now, let me just direct you to one of the uh, sheets here, the black sheets, the impact of speed. Just to give uh, clarity on this table here. This is the summary of the impacts of the speed in terms of the emissions for the different modes for uh, you know for different fuels and for the different pollutants so again as i've mentioned earlier uh, penalties are given depending on the average speed that the vehicles are running on in terms of the emissions so if you're not running on uh, or you know uh, if th there's a difference in terms of the emissions if a truck is running on uh, on average 15 kilometers per hour versus uh, if it's cruising at 60 kilometers per hour and uh, this table summarizes the uh, the speed curves in terms of the um, the penalties that it gives to the emissions for the different speed categories so these are sort of adjustments in terms of the emission factors for the different vehicles now if you don't have values for the different um, modes and categories here uh, you can actually click on the d button um, let me just give you some idea what it actually contains um, so there are factors that are relating to vehicles, you know, uh, fuel efficiency at 50 kilometers per hour. You can refer to this, copy some of them. Um, not all of them are complete, but uh, we tried our best to um, do as much as we can in terms of providing default information. Also for occupancy, for, you know, average trip lengths, and also for emission factors. Um, for the different modes for different Euro standards and for PM and NOx. So just in case uh, people don't have the values to be able to um, quickly calculate the emissions reductions, they can take some of the values here and uh, be able to run the calculations. Okay. Okay, let me just go back here again. We go to the home page and fuel efficiency. Okay, if these were empty, these were actually going to be yellow, uh, orange cells. Again, it prompts you to input um, correctly uh, in places that you need to input. And you don't need to worry about the, the blue cells since these are not indicated in your fuel split, in your technology splits, and in your modes. Okay. So it calculates averages. Uh, you need to do this for um, the three years, the base year, the intermediate year, and the future year, the final year. If you want to integrate um, fuel efficiency improvements in the fleet, you can assume certain percentages um, for the uh, in increase in uh, fuel efficiencies, or you can actually assume that the same fuel efficiencies would be maintained. It depends on the purpose of your calculation and also in terms of the data that you have. Uh, again, default values are available if you don't have the data. Okay, and uh, we go to the speed. Right now, we do have very limited information about the Bandung BRT. But we're assuming that it has would lead to actually to improvements in terms of the speed versus the mixed traffic, which is uh, assumed at 18 kilometers per hour versus 25 kilometers per hour. And uh, you can see some of the other factors here that are listed here. Uh, so speed, occupancy, trip length, trip uh, speed impact. So occupancy is here. How many people are inside? 
the vehicles at any given time. Um, and uh, right now we're assuming that the average trip lengths are equal to the uh, the BRT trip length. This would actually serve like a, a conservative measure that we don't overstate the uh, emissions reductions from the private vehicles. And also, since we don't have uh, currently good data on the average strip lengths for the different modes, um, this would serve as your indicator for the amount of vehicle kilometers traveled that are being of offset by the uh, BRT system. And uh, lastly, you would have here the uh, speed impact. Again, there's an I here, so it gives you like a brief explanation of what it is. Um, it would ask you to select a mode that would best represent, you think, the, the impact of the speed in terms of the fuel efficiency and the, the emissions for the, the vehicles that you inputted. Sometimes users would have different types of vehicles here, which are not included in the speed curves. You don't have, we don't have data for the fuel penalties and the emission penalties. So the workaround is actually to assign speed curves depending on their best judgment, whether it would, it's similar to a bus, it's similar to a car, it's similar to a two-wheeler, or maybe even a truck. So depending on the choice that you make here, it would assign the specific speed curve and assign the penalties for the fuel efficiencies and the emission factors. Okay. We're not inputting any in the NMT because this is walking. So not everything here is automated. You need to have some um, thought into the process, um, we don't need uh, the, the average speed, occupancies, trip lengths for, for the non-motorized transport since um, these are um, non-emitting modes anyway. So it's not uh, currently affecting the calculations for the emissions reductions. Now, after you define the speed impact, now you go to the emission factors. Many people would have difficulty in terms of finding appropriate emission factors. The one that we have here right now are updated. We've taken values from international sources such as the ICCT roadmap model, which gives um, fairly detailed emission factors for the different types of vehicles. Uh, vehicle fuel combination also depending on the emission standards. So we have uh, adopted the uh, values that they've put and inputted them into this model. If you have blue cells with data in them, you don't need to worry. The calculation will not include them in the whole process. It means that you just have a value there, but it doesn't take it into the calculations. So sometimes uh, you can leave values just for information or for reference in the future. Uh, it would be good to have a complete table later on. So if you can um, do some further iterations, you have the reference data there, you don't have to erase them. Um, but uh, it would highlight the, uh, the important ones, which actually would impact the calculation. So the green ones here are the ones which would be taking, taken in. Uh, for the calculations. So again, you would have to define it per vehicle emission standard and fuel combination. So what's the emission factor of a pre-euro gasoline car in terms of uh, particulate matter and uh, so on and so forth. So you need to fill this table up. As you would notice here, again, the table changes color depending on the input that you made in the earlier tables, particularly the fuel split and the emission standard split. So any, any cell here that 
would be colored orange, you would need to input something into them. You need to put input a value into these orange cells because these are the emission factors that would be assigned to these vehicles in the calculation. Okay. And uh, since we don't have anything for LPG, CNG, electric, these are left blue by the calculation sheet. Now, a small um, note about electric vehicles. There's a certain module here that enables users to calculate the emission factor of the electricity grid that would be used to power up the electric vehicles, if any, and if needed. Um, this simple calculation sheet is actually based on the small-scale methodology for CDM for calculating emissions uh, generated by a grid. And um, uh, sim uh, it contains a lot of default information from IPCC, International Panel on Climate Change, and uh, users would actually need a few, just a few inputs in order to come up with the emission factors. So for example, the CO2 emission factor would be coming um, at the unit of tons CO2 per megawatt hour. So for each megawatt hour that is being supplied by the grid, this is the amount of CO2 that is being released. And it's mainly based on the generation profile particularly the fossil fuel ones. So if you have diesel, oil, coal, natural gas that are serving the grid, um, this would have the, uh, or this would def actually define the emission factor for the said grid. Some of the other factors such as heat rate, we have some default values here. Again, carbon emission factor are taken from IPCC, global standards, and the efficiency of oxidation. Uh, again, are global standards. We've also included uh, NOx and PM into the calculations. And these are taken from um, the Global Atmospheric Pollution Forum guidelines for calculating uh, emissions from uh, power plants for NOx and PM. So the main factor here that users would actually need to fill in is the, uh, the electricity generation per source type, um, either a megawatt per hour per year, or you can actually use kilowatt hour per year, but um, the standard here is actually to use megawatt hour per year if you're talking about grids. And the summaries you would find here, um, either it's the same, um, just transformed into uh, kg per kilowatt hour. So from ton CO2 per megawatt hour here, it's similar, but uh, scaled down to kg per kilowatt hour produced. So once you have these values here, if you have electric vehicles, you can use these values and go to the emission factor sheets and define the emission factor for electric vehicles using those values from the grid calculator, grid emission factor calculator. Okay, but since we don't have um, electric vehicles in the uh, assumptions and um, in, in the projections, we are not putting any emission factor here. And uh, we are done actually with the fuel uh, intensity and emission factors tables. Oh. And the uh, project emissions from the BRT is being treated by the uh, TIMP model as a um, as composed of emissions from the BRT buses as well as the emissions that are 
generated from the construction of the uh, facilities and uh, the additional um, roadways that are needed for implementing the BRT in a very simple way. What you would need would be the uh, definition for the how much tons per kilometer is being used for cement, bitumen or asphalt, and steel for the project. So right now we're just assuming um, according to the local project uh, data, like 70 for um, these values. Let me take out bitumen. Um, this is not part of the calculations. And this one, this would serve as the emission factor for the materials. So we have taken uh, default values uh, from um, corporations, uh, from annual reports and uh, CSR reports um, in terms of how much CO2 is being generated per ton of material that they use. Um, we would definitely recommend that users look for the specific data from their suppliers. But if that's not available, again, um, there are default values um, that are available. These ones have been used in many applications and more or less would be reflective of the uh, general average in terms of um, the ton CO2 per ton of material that was consumed for cement, asphalt, and uh, steel. But the limitation here is that we're currently just um, accounting for the CO2 emissions from construction and not the PM and NOx values, since uh, these are not normally calculated by companies anyway. OK, so that's the table for the construction-related factors. And uh, here we have some economic factors. Um, this would be actually, depending on the purpose of your calculations, um, you can opt not to um, go through the economic factors, but to give a more holistic um, calculation and uh, results, we strongly suggest that these factors are inputted, particularly for looking at the um, the economic benefits and the social benefits of the project. So this is how it would actually look like. Uh, you can input your prices for the uh, fuels. Um, right now, we're assuming uh, static prices, just to be conservative in terms of the, uh, the savings. Uh, and you would need to in input the total project costs, uh, referring to the the project costs once the all the uh, kilometers uh, for the BRT have been constructed, all the uh, shelters have been constructed, how much it would be. And here you would have um, the cost, the associated cost for the pollutants. Now this is a very rough way of calculating the economic impacts of having, having uh, these um, pollutants uh, be generated or be saved by the project. Um, these ones are, uh, we've taken different studies that quote different costs for these um, pollutants, which would include environmental and uh, social considerations, social impacts as well, um, considering health impacts. As you can see, uh, particularly PM right now, it's very high because this is directly um, affecting the health of the population, particularly if the population is within a very close proximity with the sources of particulate matter, would uh, actually go into the respiratory system and would lead to different types of um, acute and uh, chronic diseases. Now, we also have um, estimates for cost of time. Um, again, you can have a look uh, probably at the 
co-benefits manual that has been produced by IGES, which has different values that were taken from um, literature for different countries. Um, they would have different values for um, different areas in different countries, and you can adopt some of those. Otherwise, uh, if you have uh, certain estimates from the project proposals or the pre-feasibility study, uh, you can take those values as well. Uh, same thing with the cost of fatality and the cost of injury would have to be taken into account. Um, discount rates and annual inflation rates um, are also taken here. And we're also asking for the, we're, ta we're taking into account the annual maintenance costs as a percentage of the construction. So this 1% is uh, taken from um, one of the projects that we, or a couple of projects that we've uh, applied the team model with. And uh, it's normally around that number.